Hello, everybody. My name is Gilda Ross, and I am the Glenbard Student and Community Projects Coordinator. There is a large crowd here already, and we're so delighted that you could join us for this very important conversation. This is an outstanding book we'll be talking about, and the person who will be interviewing, Anna, is Jessica Leahy, who has written two of my favorite books, Familiar Friend to the Glenbard Parent Series. We're in for a very, very inspiring and uh, important conversation. Um, I want to thank you for coming today. I want to thank all of our sponsors who make this possible, specifically for this program. We have partnered with the DuPage County Health Department, Serenity House, and NAMI to bring this day, this special day, forward. Uh, tonight at 7 o'clock, our only hybrid of the year is happening. We will be at Glenbard West at 6.30 for a resource fair of resources, and then at 7 p.m. Um, we'll be having a conversation. I will mention that in one minute. Our, our ask of everybody that's here is to please share the resource of the Glenbard Parent Series. This is free and open to everyone. So our ask once again is like us on social media and please do share. We welcome all. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to very, very quickly tell you about what is upcoming. As I mentioned, tonight at seven o'clock, we will be hosting um, two important people. Uh, we have a Glenbard alum who's an addiction psychiatrist at UCLA, and his name is Dr. Timothy Fong. And we're also welcoming Tom Farley, who will be talking about growing up with his brother, Chris, beloved uh, SNL actor. So that's at 7 p.m., what teens need to know. Um, love, kindness, and addiction. Um, so join us at 6.30 for that resource fair. And then uh, finishing up the year, Zen Parenting with Kathy Adams happens on December 6th at noon at 7 p.m. Then um, we're also hosting uh, two additional speakers on a similar topic. We'll be talking about drug trends and proactive parenting. The wake up call demonstration um, will be happening online this year. Uh, what do you need to know about a teenager's room and uh, how can we become proactive in raising healthy kids? Uh, Dean Jeske will be talking about one pill can kill. Should be an interesting conversation and important as well, Tuesday the 15th at seven. Uh, don't miss Andrew Solomon on January 18th. If you need to know exactly what depression looks like, he is not to be missed. So please circle your calendar. And then we'll be coming back to this topic um, when we welcome Carl Eric Fisher in April, talking about his book, The Urge, A Personal Story of Struggle from an Addiction Psychiatrist. So circle your calendar, take a look at the uh, 50 programs that we have in the Glenbard Parent Series and come back. I now like to turn it over to Rachel um, DeConsola, who will introduce our speakers today. Thank you so much. Thanks, Gilda. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us all today. My name is Rachel. I work at Serenity House Counseling Services in Addison, Illinois. Um, thank you, Glenbar Parent Series, um, Serenity House, PLT, Nami DuPage for putting on this event today. Before I introduce our speakers, just a few housekeeping things. Um, those of you who registered for CEUs, you will get an email after today's presentation with information on how to claim your um, CEUs. You are required to listen in for the full hour to receive those CEUs, and we will get a timestamped attendance report following today's presentation. Um, if you have any questions or issues receiving your CEUs, you can reach out to Jordan, and Jordan will put her email in the chat below. And now for our speakers. Um, Anna Lemke is a professor of psychiatry at Stanford University School of Medicine and chief of the Stanford Addiction Medicine Dual Diagnosis Clinic. A clinician scholar, she has published more than 100 peer-reviewed papers, chapters, and commentaries. She sits on the board of several national addiction-focused organizations, has testified before committees in the U.S. Congress, keeps an active speaking calendar, and maintains a thriving clinical practice. In 2016, she published Drug Dealer, How Doctors Were Duped, Patients Got Hooked, and Why It's So Hard to Stop, which was highlighted in the New York Times as one of the top five books to read to understand the opioid epidemic. Dr. Lemke recently appeared on the Netflix documentary, The Social Dilemma, um, an unvarnished look at the impact of social media on our lives. Dopamine Nation, Finding Balance in the Age of Indulgence. The subject of today's conversation was an instant um, New York Times bestseller and explores how to moderate compulsive overconsumption in a dopamine overloaded world. Dr. Lemke will be in conversation with Jessica Leahy, the author of the New York Times bestselling book, The Gift of Failure, 
how the best parents learn to let go so their children can succeed and the addiction inoculation, raising healthy kids in a culture of dependence to benefit her children around this family disease. Jess has taught all grades, including teaching in adolescent drug and alcohol rehab in Vermont, and serves as prevention and recovery coach. She has written about education, parenting, and child welfare for most major media outlets. We are delighted to welcome them both here today for this important conversation. And with that being said, take it away. Hello, and thank you so much for being here today. I think um, this is an incredibly important conversation. This book means so much to me as a parent and as a teacher. I think anytime we get the, um, the opportunity to understand the brain a little bit better, it can help us have a little more empathy and compassion for um, our kids and for ourselves. And I'm just, I'm so excited to be here with you, Anna, today. This is um, a huge thrill for me. So thank you so, so much for being here today. I want to get, oh, go ahead. Sorry, I'm, I apologize. No, that's okay. Thank you for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here and to, to talk to all of you. I just, I want to get right into it. I want to get straight to this word dopamine. I think when I'm out talking about um, substance use prevention and substance use in general, um, people's eyes start to glaze over a little when we get into the scientific speak. And, but I think the dopamine in particular is something that we really have to understand as human beings for ourselves and for our children. And so I guess my first basic question is, you know, what is dopamine and why should we care about it? Okay, great place to start. So dopamine is a molecule that we make inside our brains and it's what we call a neurotransmitter. And neurotransmitters are the small molecules that bridge the gap between neurons. So neurons are those long spindly cells that conduct the electrical circuits that make us who we are. But those neurons do not touch end to end. There's a little space between them. That space is called the synapse. And it's modulated by fine-tuned control of neurotransmitters, which uh, go back and forth between the neurons. So dopamine is one of many brain neurotransmitters. And it's probably the most important neurotransmitter for the experience of pleasure, reward, and motivation. What we know from about the last 75 years of neuroscientific research is that the more dopamine is that's released in a specific circuit of the brain called the reward circuit. And the faster that dopamine is released, the more likely that substance or behavior is to be reinforcing or addictive. So it's become a kind of common currency for neuroscientists to measure the addictive potential of substances and behaviors. Um, but it's also more complex than just pleasure. Um, dopamine may be even more important for the experience of motivation or the work that we're willing to do to get our reward than it is for the experience of pleasure itself. And there's a very famous experiment in which scientists and engineered um, mice to lack dopamine in this specific reward circuit of the brain. And what they found in that experiment is if they put food in the rat's mouth or the, the mouse's, the rodent's mouth, uh, the, the rodent would get seem to get pleasure from the food and eat the food. But if they put the food even a single body length away, the rodent would starve to death. In other words, dopamine is essential, not just for pleasure, but also for the motivation or desire or our willingness to do the work to get our reward. My colleague here in neuroscience at Stanford, Rob Malenka, likes to say that the way that he measures addiction in the laboratory is by measuring how hard a mouse is willing to work to get their little hunk of cheese or, or whatever it is. How many times are they willing to press a lever? How, how much of the maze are they willing to explore? Just adding a little bit to this uh, discussion of what is dopamine and what, what it does, I think it's also, um, sorry, I'm seeing that volume is too low. I'll try to speak up. I think it's also really important to um, acknowledge that dopamine is not just responsive to pleasure. It's also interestingly responsive to newness or novelty, um, which is why, for example, we can get addicted to things like the news. And we'll talk about 
the complicated relationship between pleasure and pain, but it is important to remember that dopamine is this neurotransmitter that says, oh, this is something that we need to pay attention to. Is the volume better now? I want to make sure folks can hear me. I'll let them weigh in on that. I'm Sounds good. Sounds good. Oh, a little, little thumbs up right there. I, there's a quote that I love that I used in addiction inoculation, essentially that takes it really, makes it really basic that dopamine is drive. It's the thing that makes us want to get out of bed in the morning. Like when I lay there in the morning and I'm thinking about like, oh, do I want to get up and do this work today? Dopamine or the promise of dopamine or the, you know, just the idea that I may have some sort of reward during the day for, for something is sort of the reason we get out of bed. And so that, and not, you know, that lack of dopamine experiment is really, really interesting. And for those of us who are in recovery and we have watched the permutations, the things, the complicated tasks that someone who is addicted to something will go through in order to get that thing that they are addicted to. And I have to say in your book, you do something that I absolutely love, which is the use of narrative of stories to tell, to explain better um, why dopamine is so important. And you use the, you have these beautiful stories in there about the lengths that people are go, will go to in order to satisfy their craving for whatever it is that's giving them that hit of dopamine in the brain. Um, I would love, to, since this is mainly for people who are parents, educators, mentors, I would love to get into a little bit about dopamine and kids, dopamine and the teen brain. I think the teen brain is a special place. I may be biased, but I think the teen brain is a really special place. And especially when we're talking about dopamine. And I would love for you to dig into that a little bit. Yeah. So I, um, what's important to understand about the way that the brain changes through the lifespan is that from about age zero to five, we have more neurons in the brain than we will have in our entire lifetime. Beginning at about age five, the brain starts to cut back on the neurons that we do not use frequently and starts to myelinate or grease the wheels of the neurons that we are using frequently. This process is called pruning, just like pruning a tree. And it continues up until about age 25. And the result is that through adolescence, we are slowly cutting back on neurons that we're not using, we're myelinating neurons that we are using, and we're essentially creating the scaffolding that we will be left with for our entire adult lives which is why it's so important that we get in early, both in terms of prevention for addiction and other forms of psychopathology. And we also make sure that our kids are learning healthy coping strategies that will serve them well for a lifetime. I always like to emphasize that neurogenesis or the birth of new, neuro new neurons continues throughout the lifespan. So that means that we don't need to get depressed Right, about the fact that uh, we create this critical scaffolding through adolescence and early adulthood. There is a plasticity in the brain that remains throughout the lifetime. It's just that we have the most robust plasticity or ability to change our brains in this crucial period through childhood, adolescence, and young adulthood up until about age 25. The other thing about the adolescent brain that's really important to keep in mind, and that relates specifically to what we were talking about with dopamine and novelty, is that teenagers really are um, wired from an evolutionary perspective to go out into the world and to seek out new people, new things, new places. So they're especially sensitive to novelty. They want novelty and newness. They want connections. This is hardwired so that they will go out and find mates and procreate and, 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 and continue the species. But at the same time, we also suspect that the frontal lobe, which is that large gray matter area right behind our foreheads, takes longer to develop than the reward pathway does. So that means you've got a lot of dopamine firing and seeking dopamine in adolescence without the frontal lobe being necessarily entirely hooked up to that reward circuit. And the frontal lobe is the place where we weigh future consequences. 
where we learn to delay gratification, where we learn to narrate um, our, our own stories and, and see cause and effect. So um, by definition, adolescence is kind of a, a, a time of cognitive impairment because of that frontal lobe delay. So it's important to keep that in mind, both in terms of parenting, but also in terms of um, as mental health care providers, that it's, so they're sort of a, a rarefied species. There are two things I'm so glad you said. And one is I tend to get a lot of like, you know, man, kids or adolescents, they're just wired for risk. They're just wired for risk. They want risk. And, you know, I, I'm always speaking up in their defense. And I like to say that's not necessarily true. It's just that they're, they're really wired for novelty. And there's a really good reason for that. It's because it's one of the primary functions of adolescence is we've got to push them out there and get them to try new things so that they can become ready for that adult world out there. And I'm also so glad you talked about the frontal lobe because the other thing I love to say is that if you're frustrated with your adolescent, just look at that spot right between their eyes and just remember that's not completely hooked up yet. And it gives you that moment of like, okay, they're not trying to drive me crazy. It's just that everything's not completely hooked up yet. Um, one thing I do love to talk about, also would love to, to, to talk about really quickly is the how, yes, kids are wired for novelty and, and a great way to get some of that dopamine hit that kids just crave is um, by becoming competent in things and going out and achieving something, earning a skill. And so I'm constantly trying to come up with new ways to help parents push kids towards positive risk. Um, and actually, Dr. Den Siegel had a, a great bit of advice for me because I was freaking out because uh, we moved between when my kid was in middle school and high school, which is a risky time for kids with drugs and alcohol, as you know. And he said, well, you could look at it that way, or you could reframe it and you could realize that moving is this opportunity for incredible, you know, positive risk is everywhere. So if you start engaging kids in this kind of reframing so that they can say, you know, get these hits of dopamine from competence in new areas, then you can actually feed a little bit of what they're so desperate for in their brain. So I'm so happy you talked about the novelty and that frontal lobe, because I think all of us can, you know, just look right there, just right there and remember. Um, could you talk a little bit? Um, I, I actually want to bring up a student question that I got just a couple days ago. Um, a student emailed me with like six pages of questions, but one of them was so fantastic. And it was about the fact that she knows that she's hooked on her phone. She knows she uses her phone too much and she really, really wants to cut back. And it was, she gave me the, the, cutest little thing. It said, how do I do this? Just turn it off and leave it somewhere. I think I know the answer. I just want you to tell me. So mm -hmm. Anna Lemke, could you tell this student how she can possibly wean herself or control her phone use and how that's related to dopamine and what the, what the whole purpose of dopamine is in that whole equation? Yeah, I'm happy to talk about the kind of um, intervention that we use in our clinic um, that I've used for myself and my own compulsive <laughs> consumption. Not me. I have no need for any interventions. I'm perfect. Yeah. Um, but before doing that, I wanted to go back to, to what you said just before mm -hmm. then about kind of reframing um, a, a move. And I do think that, that that's a wonderful thing to do to take sort of something that seems negative and reframe it in a positive way. But I, I also know as a parent that when I do that as my first pass intervention, I get a lot of anger and resistance. That's great. Thank you. Um, yeah. So what, so just for parents out there, um, what I, what I find you have to do first is just validate many times, um, their lived experience of how awful I am, how awful their teachers and coaches are, what bad parenting I've engaged, <laughs> you know, not, not to validate what's not true, but just to validate and listen and validate their experience. And only after you've done that, have you then like earned the credit yeah. to be able to suggest the reframe. That's yeah. just from adolescence and my own parenting that I throw out there. And I actually meant for me, I was, I needed to reframe it for me before I even got to the kid part, but I'm so glad you said that. Cause that is so essential. Yeah. Thank you. Um, 
So the, the basic framework that we use in our clinic, and we use this for people who are coming in who want help with compulsive overconsumption with myriad drugs, and I use the term drug very broadly, to encompass not just traditional drugs like alcohol, cannabis, and nicotine products, but also um, the drugs that didn't exist before, like video games, social media, online pornography, whatever it is. We use a kind of a dopamine acronym. Um, so the D of the dopamine acronym stands for data. So the very first thing to do is to have that individual, whether it's our own child or with ourselves or with a friend, really um, in a radically honest way, write down what they're using, how much and how often. And the reason that's important is because it's only when we tell another human being or engage in an exercise of writing it down that our consumption becomes real to us. It's very easy when we're chasing dopamine to kind of um, blur our eyes and see it in aggregate in a way that makes it generally less than it is. So by collecting the data and really acknowledging what we're doing, how much and how often, whether it's cannabis, alcohol, YouTube videos, Snapchat time, um, it's sort of an aha moment for people where they say, oh, wow, you know, I hadn't realized it was that much. So that's the first step. The O of dopamine uh, stands for the ob objectives around using. So why do I use this, this substance or this behavior? You know, even irrational behavior is grounded in rational ideas. And so um, I think to acknowledge, you know, why, what, what our drug does for us. So for example, I tend to watch more YouTube videos than I really want to. And I really emphasize the want because I don't want to watch that many YouTube videos, but I tend to do it. And what do I get from it? It's just kind of a great escape. It's a reward at the end of my work day. I don't have to think. I'm not ruminating on all my, you know, negative uh, sort of worries. So I, you know, I write that down. That is my uh, objective. But I the think- The kid actually mentioned that in her question. She said, sometimes I do it even when I don't really want to do it. And I don't know why I do it. So how, what do I do with that? Yeah, so that, yeah, thank you for that. Exactly. Yeah, and I think that's where the neuroscience comes in, understanding why it is we're still engaging in a behavior that we don't want to be engaging in. Um, the P of the dopamine acronym stands for problems. This is where we openly acknowledge what is not working about our drug use? Family members are upset, not doing well in school, compromising my health, my sleep, interfering with my values, right? We can lose our moral compass in this process. And then again, writing that down makes it real, getting depressed, getting anxious. One of the key things that neuroscience has shown us is that the relentless pursuit of pleasure actually puts us in a dopamine deficit state, which is very similar to clinical depression and anxiety disorders. So we're chasing relief from those symptoms only to exacerbate those symptoms in the process. And then the A of the dopamine acronym stands for abstinence. And this is really the intervention. It's the dopamine fast. It's where we commit to abstaining from the drug for a certain period of time that can vary from one day to a month, to a year, to whatever you know, the goal is. In my clinical experience, once people have become addicted and addiction is the continued compulsive use of a substance or behavior, despite harm to self and or others, once people have entered addicted brain, it usually takes on the order of four weeks of abstinence to reset reward pathways and get out of this dopamine deficit state. So planning uh, for the dopamine fast, setting a specific quit date, letting people know, for example, this person who emailed you, this is where she would maybe let her friends know, hey, I'm not going to be on social media for a while. Here's another way you can reach me. Um, you know, she can give a reason or not. You don't really have to give a reason. You can just say, I'm not going to be drinking this month, or I'm not going to be using cannabis, or I'm not going to mm -hmm. be playing video games, whatever it is, finding that people can reach you in some alternative way, and then engaging in, you know, self-binding strategies. So self-binding strategies really means changing our environment, our mental environment, but also our physical environment so that we're not constantly being tempted by our drug. We live in a world in which, which we are constantly being seduced and invited to ingest these highly reinforcing drugs and behaviors. And we only have so much willpower. And if we only rely on our willpower, we're going to get exhausted and ultimately give in. Could you so, give us some examples of self-finding? 
Yeah. So um, time itself can be a self-binding construct. So for the dopamine fast, let's say the commitment is to not use our any digital device, including um, our phones, but not TV, not any screen for 24 hours, right? So we give it a kind of um, chronological limit um, to not using. And then we say at the end of that 24 hours, I will allow myself to go back to being on the screen. Um, with digital media, we could also use a categorical form of self-binding. I'm going to go on my phone, but I'm going to delete Snapchat. I'm not going to um, do Snapchat. I can do other things. Maybe Facebook is okay. Or for video games, you know, I'm going to play with friends, but I'm not going to play with strangers. These are forms of like creating these barriers. Another form to so that time we have, you know, categorical where we say I'm going to eat, you know, um, let's say with food is a common one. I'm not going to eat sugar for a certain period of time. Um, and then uh, we can also use milestones. I'm gonna wait till I finish this quarter, uh, study for my exam, get my promotion at work. That, that's another one. And then there's also just literal physical barriers where we take the phone away. Um, or we, um, you know, we did that with our youngest son who clearly when he got his phone freshman year in high school, wasn't able to manage it. Um, our older three children, they seemed able to manage it. He didn't. So this is also important too, because kids are different, right? And I also have... would like to point out, I was at a Harvard conference one time and a very famous, very prominent, very accomplished Harvard professor said, yeah, I'm using this thing where my computer literally won't let me get on the Wi-Fi for a certain period of time. And someone in the audience said, why don't you just turn it off? And he said, because I can't, I can't do it. I need something to just turn it off for me. And this is a very accomplished adult with a well-functioning frontal lobe. So it's not just kids. Right, exactly. And, you know, we talk about this abstinence or dopamine fast to reset reward pathways and get dopamine firing back up to healthy levels. So important so that we can experience joy in more modest rewards, get out of that state of craving, but also see true cause and effect that we can't see when we're chasing dopamine. Um, and then, you know, after that abstinence fast, then we can, we can also decide to go back to using our drug of choice if we want to, but in more moderation. And that's where these categor categorical and, uh, you know, other types of self-binding become so important so that we're, we're not exhausting our willpower. So just to quickly finish the dopamine acronym, because I know you have a lot of questions and I don't want to take too long with this, but the, um, you know, the, the dopamine M stands for mindfulness. Um, I always like to define mindfulness because it's a term we use so much and we, we often don't define it. Mindfulness is the, uh, the skill really that we can cultivate to observe our own thoughts and um, feelings without judgment and also without trying to flee from them so that we become acquainted with ourselves in a new way, but also recognize that these thoughts bubble up um, on their own, really. We don't have to intentionally have thoughts and emotions. They come unbidden and they have their own lifespan, typically quite brief. And if we can just be mindfully observant of them without trying to use our phones or some other drug to distract ourselves, uh, we will get to know ourselves, which is important, and we will see that they also uh, disappear after a period of time. So that's mindfulness is really important part of this exercise, and the, uh, the dopamine fast forces us to practice that mindfulness. The I of the dopamine acronym stands for insight, and this is where we get that aha moment. And the biggest aha moment that I see in my clinical practice, but I've also experienced it myself, is the patients who come in and say, well, I need my cannabis to treat my anxiety disorder or being on social media and playing video games is the only thing that relieves my depression and nothing else works. And what folks don't see is how these behaviors actually drive depression and anxiety until they take a break from it. And in my experience, it takes about 10 to 14 days of not using our drug minimum in order to be able to see, oh, I'm feeling less anxious and depressed. And it's probably because I'm not using that drug. Very, very hard initially because we go into active withdrawal 
And then we create all kinds of stories and get in the state of craving around why we should use our drug, even though we committed to abstain for a period of time. Honestly, if we can just get to day 10 or 14, the sun starts to come out, we start to feel less anxious and depressed. There's this aha moment, the insight moment where, wow, I thought cannabis was helping my sleep. Now I can see at day 14, I'm sleeping much better. And the cannabis was actually uh, you know, interfering with my ability to sleep. So that's a really exciting moment in clinical work when people come back and they say, you wouldn't believe it, Dr. Lumpke, I feel better. And of course, I, I believe it. I mean, it's what I had hoped for, but it's such a surprise to people that it's, it's, a, it's, it's really a, their own discovery. And the reason that that's very powerful, especially with adolescents, is because we can use all of our powers of persuasion, but until they've had their own lived experience to see the cause and effect of their drug use in their lives, they really won't be motivated to make a change. So we have to ask them to do the experiment so they can have the experience, which will then be their aha moment. And then they're now motivated to continue either abstinence or moderation, whatever it is. So N stands for next steps. That's where they come back after the dopamine fast, have the aha moment, and then think about, all right, do I wanna to continue to abstain or do I want to go back to using? Most young people want to go back to using, but they want to use in moderation. But then we talk very specifically what that looks like. What is your specific goal for using? How many days a week? How much? In what context? What will you use? With whom? As much specificity as possible. And then they go out and the E of dopamine is for experiment. Then they go back out again and they experiment and they see if it works. And some of them are successful and then some of them are not. It's all data. You know, you come back and say, all right, well, that didn't work. Maybe moderation isn't going to work for you, right? But it's this iterative process of self-discovery. I'll stop there. Thanks for indulging me through that dopamine acronym. No, oh, that's incredibly helpful. Um, what I what I'm now curious about is okay, this is great. And I as a grown-up think that would be a fantastic strategy for me. So what's the um what's the how do we find a lever to help our kids get to the place where they're willing to engage in that? I mean, I talk about mindfulness and the addiction inoculation too. And then I'm like, yeah, well, I tried to get my kid to, you know, meditate with me for 30 days and she lasted for three, <laughs> you know, how do we help kids engage in that experiment so that they can get to that 10 or 10th or 14th day and say, oh my gosh, wow. Um, a couple things. First of all, I invite kids to think about how they feel when they're playing a video game or on social media versus how they feel right before they have to stop and then right after they stop. And, and for me, that's a really um, important moment because it's a window really into what's happening in the brain. And may, this might be a good opportunity to talk about um, how pleasure and pain are processed in the brain. Because this is one of the, I think, the most ex exciting finding in-, in No, please, let's let's talk about pain. I think, um, you know, as a parent myself, the last thing I want to do is see my kid in pain. And yet pain, the pain and pleasure stuff in the book is so important. I was really hoping we'd get to this. So please do. Okay, great. And I'm just going to go through the acronym again, because there's yeah. a person that wonder right? I stands for insight. So D is data. That's where we- collect the data on what we're using, how much, how often. O is objectives for use, why we use our drug. P is problems associated with use. A stands for abstinence. That's the abstinence trial or the dopamine fast. That's essentially the experiment. M stands for mindfulness. I stands for insight. That's the aha moment that we get when we see true cause and effect. N stands for next steps. That's where we make our plan for what to do after the dopamine fast is over. And E stands for experiment, where we go out again and, and give that a try. So one of the exciting findings in neuroscience in the past 75 years or so is that pleasure and pain are co-located in the brain. So the same parts of the brain that process pleasure also process pain, and they work like opposite sides of a balance. So if you imagine that in your brain, there's a teeter-totter like in a kid's playground, when we do something pleasurable, it tips one way, painful, it tips the other. There are three rules governing this balance. The first rule is that the balance wants to remain level. And our brains will work very hard with any deviation from neutrality to get back to that neutral position or what neuroscientists call homeostasis. So let's say I watch a YouTube video, I get a little burst of dopamine in my specific reward circuit. 
and my pleasure pain balance tilts to the side of pleasure. No sooner has that happened than my brain is actively working to downregulate my dopamine receptors and my dopamine production to bring it level again. And I like to imagine that as these neuroadaptation gremlins hopping on the pain side of the balance to bring it level again. But the gremlins really like it on the balance. So they don't get off as soon as it's level. They stay on until it's tilted an equal and opposite amount to the side of pain. That's called the come down, the after effect, the hangover, or the opponent process mechanism. I experience that as craving. And that can happen even while we are ingesting the drug. So e even while I'm watching a TikTok video, I'm already craving the next video. Even as I'm finishing that first piece of chocolate, I'm already thinking that I want another piece of chocolate. Why? Because the way that we restore a level balance is first by tilting an equal and opposite amount to the side of pain which is a dopamine deficit state, which is craving. Now, if I wait long enough, if I don't hit the next episode button on the Netflix, or actually come to feel net Netflix, you don't even have to hit next episode. You just have to not hit the screen and we'll go to the next one, which says a lot about our world today. But anyway, for the child- And that interval has gotten shorter, by the way. They've shortened the interval so that now it happens faster. Scary. If I wait long enough, those gremlins hop off and homeostasis is restored and that feeling of craving passes. But if I have my drug in abundance, which we all do now, right? And I ingest more and more of that drug over time, I eventually accumulate enough gremlins on the pain side of the balance to fill this whole room. And this is what happens as we become addicted. We essentially get these gremlins camped out tents and barbecues in tow on the pain side of the balance and effectively change our pleasure pain set point. Now we need to continue to use our drug, not to feel pleasure, but just to level the balance and feel normal. When we're not using, we're walking around with a balance that's tilted to the side of pain, experiencing the universal symptoms of withdrawal from any addictive substance or behavior, which are anxiety, irritability, insomnia, dysphoria, and craving, and other things that used to be pleasurable to us are no longer pleasurable because everything is competing with those gremlins. So one of the ways to get in with kids is to say, you know, I hear you that this is a relief for you to smoke pot or to play video games, but is it possible that really what you've done is changed your hedonic or joy set point such that the relief you're getting is, is, is really pulling you out of this dopamine deficit state? And the more that you do of your drug, the deeper you go into that dopamine deficit state such that you're really exacerbating. And of course, the dopamine fast or the abstinence trial is that aha moment when they realize because when they stop using for long enough, those gremlins eventually get the memo and start to hop off the pain side of the balance and homeostasis is restored, which is normal, healthy baseline firing. So th those are the first and second rules of the balance, the being that there's just this opponent process mechanism for every pleasure, we pay a price and that price is pain. The second rule is that with repeated pleasure, we reset our hedonic set point to the side of pain and now we're in the state of addiction or craving. And then the third is that once those gremlins are created, unfortunately, they never go away. They might hop off the balance, but they're waiting in the wings. So that means that if we reuse our drug, there's no ramp up period where immediately all that army of gremlins hops on the pain side of balance and we can be thrust immediately back into our addiction, which is the bad news. I think anyone who ever, if, I think anyone who's ever spend any time with someone who's been addicted to something um, and has relapsed understands that, that it's a really difficult concept to sort of wrap your brain around that for, if I were to take a drink today, I would start off in a much worse place than if I were taking my first drink when I was 12. That's right. Exactly. And then the other key thing about this, the third rule of the balance is that um, we can be triggered by reminders of our drug. So even just an alert or a notification or a push notification that someone texted us or someone liked something that we posted, or there's a new video game to play, that actually releases a little bit of dopamine in the reward pathway, followed by a little mini dopamine deficit state. So we get into that cycle of intoxication and craving even when we're just reminded of our drug, hence the importance of these self-binding strategies, turning off notifications, deleting apps, putting the phone 
away from us. I think there's so much emphasis on like, you know, ways we can use the phone more judiciously and that's great, but we also have to literally separate from the devices for a period of time, I think, to reset reward pathways, whether it's for a day or within a given day. Can we talk about, um, we've talked about sort of emotional pain and sort of just feeling, yeah. Um, but can we talk a little bit, um, one of the things that was striking to me, you know, when I took my kid to get their wisdom teeth out, my oldest kid is that I was automatically given a prescription for opiates and that I declined because, um, you know, I'm married to a physician and we were like, you know, we think we're going to handle it with ibuprofen. Thanks so much. But the la- and we're in a place now where if we wanted to avoid pain in our children, chemically, we could get pretty far with that. Is there a role for pain in the brain in our, you know, in our um, evolution as human beings, as our sort of growth as, as individuals? Because um, I, I would love to talk a little bit about what you cover in the book that's so important, I think, is, is the role of pain in human beings, lives and experiences. Yeah, so let me start let me start by going back to this pleasure pain balance. So remember when we press on the pleasure side, those gremlins hop on the pain side and over time we can reset our hedonic set point to the side of pain. But the opposite is also true. If we intentionally press on the pain side of the balance, those neuroadaptation gremlins will hop on the pleasure side of the balance and we can reset our hedonic set point to the side of pleasure. This is the science of hormesis Hormesis is Greek for to set in motion. And what we're essentially setting in motion is is our body's own healing mechanisms. When we expose our body to mild to moderate doses of noxious or toxic stimuli, we trigger our body to start to upregulate things like dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, which are are all these feel good hormones that we want. So the, so, and, and ultimately we re- reset our pleasure pain pathway so that we are more receptive to pleasure and more resilient in the face of pain. And that is exactly what we want and what we need to encourage in our world today where we're surrounded by an infinite quantity, variety, high potency, highly reinforcing drugs and behaviors. We, uh, you know, one of the arguments I make in, in, in my book is we really need to seek out kind of a new form of asceticism where we intentionally encourage our children and ourselves to do things that are hard and to do things that are actually painful. And in doing so, we are going to reset our brains to the place that they were really intended. So we evolved, this this pleasure pain balance evolved over millions of years of evolution for a world of scarcity and ever-present danger. It is woefully mismatched for this world of abundance. So this is things like exercise, ice cold water baths, intermittent fasting, or even just sustained attention through meditation, prayer, intellectual activities. Uh, This is things like radical honesty, which I talk about in the book, trying to go through a single day and not tell a single lie, which takes effort because the average adult tells one to two lies per day. We're sort of natural liars. And to actually monitor ourselves using our frontal lobe to not lie is effortful, is hard, um, probably releases dopamine in all kinds of ways, probably because it fosters true intimacy. And we know that um, true intimacy you know, releases oxytocin, the love hormone, which binds to dopamine releasing neurons in the reward pathway. So all of this is really the message is We need dopamine, dopamine is not bad, but we need to pay for our dopamine up front. And that way we avoid that dopamine deficit state. So for example, there's just loads and loads of data showing that exercise is immediately toxic to cells, but we know exercise is good for us. How can we understand that? What we find is that when you measure dopamine levels in the brain, when people engage in exercise, initially there's no dopamine in contrast to an intoxicant, which releases a lot of dopamine all at once. What you get with exercise is a gradual increase in dopamine firing over the latter half of the exercise. And then here's the key point, dopamine firing remains elevated for hours afterward, even once we've stopped exercising before it goes down to tonic baseline levels of dopamine firing. We all we all have a tonic baseline level of dopamine firing, so it never goes into that dopamine deficit state. Unlike intoxicants, where we get a spike of dopamine followed by hard free fall down below baseline levels, now you're in that dopamine 
deficit state of craving, the gremlins on the pain side of the balance, until eventually, if you don't use more of your drug, the gremlins hop off and homeostasis is restored. Okay, I was wondering if we could really, if it's possible, and you can let me know if it's not, to hit the, the comment in the comments section about people who are dysregulated on the pain side. Sure. Um, you mean in the chat? Yeah, sorry, in the chat. Yeah, about someone who, in, and I know you, um, the topic of like fibromyalgia, the topic of chronic depression, these have come up um, in, they come up in your book, they come up in some interviews that you've done. And I was wondering if we could hit on those, because that's a tough side of the balance to be on as well. Oh, yeah. So I'll read the question. It says, what if your homeostasis point or happiness set point is below average or tipped toward pain constantly? like in the case of chronic depression or dysthymia where the normal is not balanced? Great question. We probably all come into this world with a different homeostatic set point. And there are definitely um, you know, people who are sort of naturally tilted to the side of pain. I would count myself as one of those, somebody who's just by nature dysthymic or people who have physical chronic pain conditions. Um, and what we know is that people who have physical chronic pain or people who have um, you know, mental illness of any sort that causes them suffering are more likely to become addicted for self-medication reasons. They're looking for something to get them out of this hole. They try a drug, it works. And so you know, they're more likely to do it again, right? Alcohol but and anxiety, baby. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But the problem is that self-medication isn't actually medication because no matter where you start with this pleasure pain balance, the gremlins work the same way. So if you start with a pleasure pain balance tilted to the side of pain and you find a drug that you know puts you at the neutral level, those gremlins don't care. They're gonna oppose the direction by hopping on the pain side of the balance and then ultimately tilting you even further down into a dopamine deficit state where you started. And this has been the story of the opioid epidemic for the past 25 years that you know, Purdue sold us a bill of goods that we could use opioids daily at high doses to treat minor and chronic pain conditions and that they would continue to work and that no dose was too high. Well, that turned out to be patently false because what happens with opioids even when you take them for a bona fide pain condition is that the brain adapts to those opioids over time and ultimately resets your pain threshold such that you develop something called, or you can develop something called opioid-induced hyperalgesia, where not only is your pain worse in the original source of your disease process, but you now have pain in parts of your body where you never had pain before because you've changed those pain thresholds. And this, I think, is really important when we're looking at increasing rates of anxiety, depression, and suicide, which closely correlate with wealth of nations. So the richer the country, the higher the rates of depression, anxiety, and suicide. And that's kind of a puzzle, right? It's sort of, why would that be? And I think one of the ways to explain that is, is that we're basically, we have this fire hose of dopamine that our brains were not evolved for. And as we try individually and collectively to compensate for too much dopamine, we're driving our brains down into this dopamine deficit state, which looks exactly like anxiety, depression, and can lead to suicidal thinking. I, I hate to be a cliche, um, but one of the most important parts of he helping with my anxiety or anytime I sort of tip in that way is one of the worst things in the entire world is to get into cold water. It's, I hate it so much. And yet it's become a daily practice for me simply because I can't deny that for the rest of the day, I feel so fantastic. And, you know, that's really tipping myself in a horrible direction in the pain, in the pain direction, but it, it works. I can't, you know, it's sort of proof of concept. Yeah. Yeah, that's, let's talk about that for a second. So there are studies, you know, studies showing now measuring dopamine levels with cold um, ice water bath immersion. And again, seeing similar to exercise, dopamine, dopamine levels rise slowly over the latter half of the bath and then remain elevated for hours afterwards before going back down to baseline. There's no dopamine deficit state because you paid for your dopamine up front. Um, and, and I like so that terminology that, I paid up front because it, man, it hurts. It's not fun. Right. You didn't take it out on credit. You, you paid for it in cash. Um, 
And, but, but now let, here's one thing. Um, so that has to be, the, the science of hormesis tells us it has to be the right amount of pain. If it's too little for a given person, it's not going to work. But if it's too much, it's going to be harmful. So we're not talking about self-cutting, although self-cutting works through this exact same mechanism. What happens when, when we cut on ourselves, which is a maladaptive coping strategy that people use? Well, it basically signals to the body injury. There's the release of endogenous opioids, the opioids that we make, as well as dopamine. And we feel better for a while. The problem is that it's too intense a pain. So we're pressing too hard and too fast on the pain side of the balance and ultimately then depleting our opioid system so that we've got nothing left. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about doing just enough for our body, whatever that may be, so that we upregulate dopamine, but don't deplete our dopamine stores. Um, I think at, we have to wrap for questions. Um, since I, we sort of have an idea of where they where we are with questions, I'd like to take the last couple of minutes that we have together to, to just the two of us to talk a little bit about one of my favorite parts of your book, because the part that you um, mentioned really, really quickly, which is about radical honesty. And I think this is where this book turns into one of the most important parenting books around from my perspective, because this section on honesty towards the end, I think is so important. What on earth does honesty have, with, have to do with dopamine? Honesty with our kids in particular. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. Um, I'm, I'm honored to have you say that about, about Dopamine Nation. And um, radical honesty is something I 100% learned from my patients in recovery. Um, there was a consistent pattern that patients who got into recovery from severe addiction and stayed in recovery were people who had learned they couldn't lie about anything. It wasn't just that they couldn't lie about their drug use. They couldn't lie about what they had for breakfast or why they were five minutes for a meeting, right? And what they found was that if they told even little seemingly insubstantial lies, that that would then tip them over into the bigger lies that would tip them over into relapse. And so we're I really the, good at it, Dr. Lemke. We're so good at it. <laughs> yes, I know. Trust me, a struggle for me. Um, and, and so I became really fascinated by that, including the neuroscience. And, and there's, a, a, I can't cover everything about why Truth telling is actually healthy and adaptive for our brains and for our relationships and for our kids and our families. But essentially it works on many levels. First, it works on the intimacy level. We think that when we reveal the ways in which we're broken and flawed that people will go running, but the opposite happens. People feel like an intimacy um, it's a real strong sense of being drawn toward us, completely paradoxical. We're so afraid to expose our foibles. And yet when we do, it causes a release of this healthy kind of dopamine. It's a hard thing that we do. One of the hardest things that I find is to apologize, to genuinely apologize when I've wronged somebody. But when I do, I'm shocked every time how it brings us closer together. It was worth it. Um, the other thing that radical truth telling probably does is it probably strengthens and upregulates the prefrontal cortex. Now remember the prefrontal cortex is that gray matter area behind our foreheads. It's so important for future planning, appreciating uh, future consequences, being able to delay gratification and also narrate our lives. And remember our autobiographical narratives, they're a way to organize the past, but importantly, they also become a kind of roadmap for the future. And if we're not telling true stories about ourselves to ourselves and to other people, we're losing out on a bunch of the important data we need to make good decisions. Plus, we're not stimulating that prefrontal cortex, which is part of that reward pathway, which is so important for making sure that those gremlins don't get out of control. So I have really adopted that in my own life. It's also very tangible. Like, you know, yeah. if you want to challenge, you can just say, you know what, today I'm going to try to get through my day without telling a single lie, not even an exaggeration lie, which is the lies that I'm really vulnerable to. It's like, I tend to want to tell, I feel like the stories about my life aren't exciting enough. So when I tell a story, let's say to my family, I, I tend to want to exaggerate it. Like, let's say I was waiting for somebody for five minutes and I got annoyed. I look bad getting annoyed after just five minutes, but what if I had to wait for 20 minutes? Then I'm really justified in getting annoyed. So when I'm telling the story, I'm like, and then I had to wait for like 20 minutes. Well, it's not true. I didn't have to wait for 20. Those kinds of lies are very interesting. And when we start to pay attention to them, we see them crop up all the time. And if we can try to go through a whole day and not tell those kinds of lies, it 
it, I really think it, 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 it does a lot of good for our brains, our relationships, and we model that for our children. It, lying is contagious. Telling the truth is also contagious. Uh, and I have some you know, stories of how that works. It's also good for our kids to see that we're flawed people too, and that, that we do the best with what we've got. And when we screw up, we apologize and we move forward from a place of trying to be a better human being. Um, someone Absolutely. asked really spe specifically about vaping. Um, it's a, a concern, obviously, since it's one of the areas, uh, the drug uh, uh, categories that is up a little bit. Um, and they're asking about, is it more of a challenge to abstain from vaping because of the flavor and nicotine impact on dopamine? Um, say that again. I'm sorry. Say yeah, the, the question, it's a little unclear, but what I think they're trying to get at is that, is this about the, the way flavor and nicotine impacts on the dopamine? Is this just, is, is stopping vaping so hard because it's just about the dopamine? Is it because the flavor is an experience that the kids get? Is the nicotine and the fact that we know that nicotine does work to help us make more mentally, it helps with our mental acuity and blah, blah, blah. Which part of stopping vaping is really tough for kids? Well, nicotine itself is very addictive, right? And a lot of kids now also vaping cannabis, which is very addictive. Um, these cartridges allow for a very high potency quantity and um, a, a delivery of nicotine. And when you think about what makes things addictive in the modern world, it's access, quantity, potency, and novelty. And we have that in spades. Yeah. But the other thing is that when you take two drugs or more and combine them together, you get a more potent drug. So when you take a flavor like mango, which is pleasing and releases dopamine, and then you combine it with nicotine, which is highly reinforcing and releases a lot of dopamine, then you get actually a more potent drug than either of those drugs, uh, either of those, you know, I think that's the first time I've ever heard someone refer to a flavor as being part of the, um, of that feedback loop. It's, and that's, thank you for that. Because I think people tend oh, to yeah. see just the flavors as, eh, no big deal. What's the, what's the problem there? Yeah, no, no, that, that, that's a big part of it. Um, and just flavors in general. I mean, we're, we're at a very um, advanced stage in flavors, not just in nicotine products, flavors in food. A lot of our food has been chemically engineered, um, you know, to be very, very potent. Food has become a drug. That's why we have things like French toast ice cream, like as if French toast alone and ice cream alone isn't <laughs> enough. Right. So, and that, and you see that everywhere. Like, um, I, 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 I can very easily, you know, overwatch American Idol, and I thought, why is it? Is it just the music? No, it's the music. Plus, it's a competition. Plus, it's social media. Plus, you know, plus, plus, plus. Yeah. Um, someone asked very specifically about whether there is a place in today's world to use terms like self-discipline and delayed gratification, because you're talking in terms of balance and moderation. And is there room for, um, you know, to, to still think about self-discipline as something that um, we can use as a term of art uh, these days when it comes to addictive substances? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, what I'm trying to emphasize here is actually what's going on in the brain as we find we have to steal ourselves or discipline ourselves. Um, you know, how can we understand why that is so difficult? And I think, you know, much of modern mental health wants to locate the disease process in a person's brain. And that's accurate to a point for some people, but really we live in a diseased world. It's very hard not to be addicted in the world that we live in today. And it really is this, this stress vulnerability diathesis. It's this interaction between our brain's own innate vulnerability, what we were born with and the world we live in that really determines uh, what, what is mental illness and how many of us get it. Um, for example, I do think that people in recovery from addiction, you know, thousands or millions of years ago, probably were the most resilient people in the tribe, because those were the people that were willing to work harder, you know, go further, take more risks in order to find, you know, food and find mates. Um, it's only in this world of overwhelming abundance where those kinds of traits now become a liability. So I think, yeah, it's, it's okay to use those terms, but it's good to you know, understand and appreciate the extent to which addiction really is the loss of autonomy and loss of voluntariness 
um, once we get into the addicted brain. Yeah, that's the only problem I think I usually have with the idea of self-discipline um, is that, you know, when it comes to certain things, you know, it, it's easy to throw that term around. And yet, as you have so clearly articulated, um, at a certain point, our brain is a really powerful um, organ that takes some of that self-discipline away, or at least reduces it. Um, I would love to, I know that there are some questions waiting in the background and Gilda, I just wanted to make sure we turn it back to you since we're at the top of the hour. Anna, can we go for another minute or so, or is that okay with you? Okay, thank you, thank you. And Jessica, wonderful, just wonderful, the two of you. What a, what a special hour. And, and because of your kindness, we can share this again broadly. I'm so grateful. Thank you so, so much. Okay, Jarrett, why don't you go first with your question? Sure, great presentation, Anna. Thank you so much. Um, I had actually read, uh, I want to say maybe it was like an op-ed that you wrote, um, I think maybe a month ago or so, that actually was talking about... Um, like the proliferation of like online gambling and gaming and stuff like that. Um, and how, you know, that can be just as dangerous. And you talked about, you know, online pornography and gaming and things like that. Um, are you seeing more and more of that gambling side come out um, and people that are seeking treatment? And do you find that those things are, um, you know, in some ways harder or easier than dealing with uh, addictions that involve like substance use? Yeah, great question. Um, so we are seeing uh, a lot more uh, gambling addiction, um, and I and pornography addiction, sex addiction, um, and I. It's clearly traceable to the advent of the smartphone and twenty four seven internet access, as well as the loosening of regulations around uh, these online activities. So the op-ed that I wrote was in response to a proposition here in California that was going to legalize online sports betting. Online sports betting is currently illegal in the state of California. And um, I worked with others to really strongly um, oppose that motion. Fortunately, it, it, uh, you know, it did not pass. But um, again, when you think about what, what makes something addictive, the, the biology is the release of dopamine in the reward pathway. The more that's released and the faster that it's released, uh, the more addictive. But what you have environmentally is the four components of access, one of the biggest risk factors for addiction. Uh, quantity, the more you have of a drug, the more likely you are to use more and quantity and frequency matter, the more likely you are to get addicted to that drug. You also have potency. And we talked about how you can combine a more than one drug together to overcome potency. The other way is to change delivery mechanisms so that you're getting more to the brain faster. For example, Xanax is more potent than clonopin because of its quick onset of action. And then uh, um, novelty, right? We, we have this, uh, dopamine's highly sensitive to novelty. So, you know, you play, you bet on one sports thing, but then all of a sudden you can bet on another team or you can, you know, you can bet on your own kid's little league game. I mean, this, the ways in which everything has become uh, sort of commodified and essentially drugified has meant that we're seeing a surge uh, in, in addiction, um, you know, across the United States and, and across the world, especially in developed nations. Thank you, Jared. Thank you, Anna. Felicia, you're up next. Hi there. I'm just very um, grateful for this presentation and to be with um, people that are just so renowned and we've learned so much from you. So I wanted to say thank you for that. I. Um, I'm privileged to do school presentations and I really don't hit on the dopamine system. And do you think that's essential for addictive prevention education and what age should that be started? Um, yeah, thank you for that. Um, because one of the reasons that I wrote Dopamine Nation was to get uh, knowledge of the basic neuroscience of pleasure and pain out there because I believe it really empowers people to understand what is happening as they um, get into the cycle of compulsive overconsumption and ultimately addiction if it goes to that. And I feel that this knowledge is very, very helpful uh, for people understanding what's happening to them and also making changes in their lives, um, not feeling that they're just weak-willed or um, losers or lazy or undisciplined, but really seeing how any of us can get caught up in this vortex yeah. because of the highly drugified nature of the world that we live in today. So, and I think that even very young children can understand this pleasure-pain balance. So for example, my niece went to, um, 
an outdoor summer camp in northern Wisconsin. And I learned from her that there they talk about um, type one pain and type two pain. Uh, no, no, type one pleasure and type two pleasure. Type type one pleasure is the pleasure that you get immediately, like from you know, eating a cupcake. But type two pleasure is the pleasure that you get from portaging your canoe from one lake to another and doing that successfully, even though it hurt. So this idea, I think, is really intuitive. It's ancient, by the way. Plato talked about it. Every major religion uh, talks about it. But now we have the neuroscience to really support it, which I love. Like if you look at, for example, atomic theory, Democritus in like 800 BC um, already came up with the idea that the universe consists of quantifiable atoms, which are finite, although very large in number. And it wasn't until Newtonian physics and Einstein that we could find scientific data for that. I feel like this is the same thing. We know that the relentless pursuit of pleasure leads to pain. And we know that doing things that are hard make us feel better. But now we have the science to prove it. Thank you. Danny, you are up next. Hey guys, thank you so much. It was an awesome presentation. Uh, I love the fact that you talked about and Jared asked about the process addiction versus um, substances is one of the things I had in mind. But when thinking specifically for children, adolescents, I mean, it could be adults as well. One of the populations near and dear to my heart are those with developmental disabilities. So how does this uh, come into, how does that come into play um, in terms of the dopamine pain scale? So people with developmental disabilities are receptive to understanding the pleasure pain balance in my clinical experience. Um, the gremlins and the balance, it's such a simple concept when it's drawn out and they can relate it to their own experience and it resonates. So I do think that although it can be more challenging um, to, um, you know, depending upon the level of the, the disability, um, to have them understand those concepts, I think they can be understandable. And then the dopamine fast or the abstinence trial experiment can be a sort of aha moment. I think fundamentally, um, the way that the pleasure pain balance works in the brain of disabled people is identical to everybody else. Why do I think that? Because it's phylogenetically conserved across species and over millions of years of evolution. It's deep in the midbrain. And if you look at that and uh, dissect the anatomy of the reward pathway, it's essentially identical in the lizard brain as it is in the human brain. And it's identical and, and conserved, that is to say, unchanged over millions of years of evolution. So it's a very robust, very, very old part of the brain that's not likely to be different in people who are develop developmentally delayed. I hope that was an answer to your question. It was. Thank you so much. Our last question, and thank you for letting us go long here. I'm so grateful. Jordan Esther of the DuPage County Health Department, our partner today. Jordan, take it away. Yes, thank you. And thank you, um, Dr. Lemke and uh, Dr. Leahy. Love this, this concept, this conversation, very eye-opening. Um, my question, uh, you made a comment about, you know, the richer countries, the more access to things, you see some dopamine levels vary or depression rates can be higher. I think that's what you said. And I did not say it as anywhere near as eloquently as you did. Um, in DuPage County and the county where we live and work, we do have some self-report data from middle and high school students on depression rates and their feelings of depression. And our rates here in DuPage County are at least double compared to the national average. And you know, we are an affluent county. We have lots of resources. And I'm just wondering if that um, statement that you said plays a role into maybe these higher depression rates. And I know you know, you haven't met our kids or talked to them, but I'm just wondering if you could speak a little bit to that and, and what that those raw data numbers might mean if we look at it from a different angle. Well, first of all, thank you for collecting uh, those data points. I think it's really important that we are tracking that and that we're thinking outside of the box about what may be causing it. You know, it's this is a complex a disease process, mental, mental illness broadly. It's multifactorial. There are innate inherited vulnerabilities. There are lots of contextual um, and experiential vulnerabilities, what I like to call nurture, nature, and neighborhood. We talk a lot about things like trauma, um, you know, uh, sociological or, 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 or socially demographic upheaval, 
uh, social inequality. But what I'm trying to put forth, you know, in Dopamine Nation is that abundance itself is a massive stressor on the human brain. We are not wired for abundance. We are wired for scarcity. And it's paradoxical because, of course, we think that the more we have of all these comforts and the more insulated we are from pain, the happier we'll be. But we've clearly reached some kind of tipping point where uh, it's too much of a good thing. And to understand that, we can look to neuroscience and see what happens when the brain is exposed to too much pleasure and too insulated from pain we get out of balance. It's not what we were evolutionarily wired for. It's a wiring mismatch. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Jordan. You will now want to run out to your local bookstore or to the public library and pick up these books where we will continue to dive into this very, very important information. Oh, yes. Jessica has her book up, too. Yes. <laughs> and Anna's got hers. Let's get a screenshot. I've got Jessica's book at home. Oh, okay. I'll hold it up for you, Dr. Lemke. Here it is on your behalf. Thank you so much, everybody. In just a couple of hours, we'll be getting together again. So get to your computer at the 7 p.m. Central or walk into the uh, library at Glenbard West at 6.30 for a resource fair when we'll continue the conversation with Dr. Timothy Fong and uh, Tom Farley talking about his brother, Chris, love, kindness, and addiction, what teens need to know. Largest audience we've had here at noon, um, Dr. Lemke. Um, and that's because of, uh, of you and your important work. Jessica, I can't think of anybody else who could have done a, a more wonderful job this afternoon. Thank you, everybody. So many thank yous coming in. See you next time, everybody. Thank We're going to hug the key. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody. Bye.